Greetings, and thanks so much for tuning in to learn more about the equity rubric that we've developed for the Green Journal special issue on racism and reproductive health. My name is Ebony Carter. I identify as a cisgender Black woman, and I am honored to serve as the Associate Editor for Equity at the Green Journal. I'm joined by four of my colleagues from the Special Issue Steering Committee Working Group that created this rubric, and our purpose here is to briefly provide some context and acquaint you with it. They'll introduce themselves to you now, and then we'll dive in. Hi, my name is Samantha Batman, and I identify as a cisgender Mexican-American, Asian, and white woman who um, is working as a gynecologic oncology fellow. Hello, everyone. My name is Tenny Brown. I identify as a cisgender Black woman of Nigerian heritage. I am also your gynecologist in Chicago. Hi, everyone. Edwin Lindo, a cisgendered male, Central American indigenous that works out of the University of Washington School of Medicine, where I focus on critical race theory and bringing that work into uh, our research. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Rivlin. I'm an OBGYN and a complex family planning provider at the University of Chicago. I'm also a white cisgendered woman born and raised by Jewish immigrant parents in the Deep South. I'm a mother and an abortion provider who has lived and worked in disparate abortion policy climates. I work hard as a physician and researcher to better understand how my background and the privileges I've enjoyed may inform and bias how I conduct research, my patient interactions, and my everyday experiences. The idea for the equity rubric was born in part because when I became the associate editor for Equity at the Green, I noticed peer reviews for health equity papers coming back largely in one of two flavors. Either, I'm so excited that this work is happening and it has to be published with no critical review or an extremely harsh review that held the paper to a much higher standard than any other paper would be subjected to. We knew that for this issue, we had to take a different approach. So we formed a working group to create a rubric that would help us to systematically evaluate the submissions coming into this issue in a fair and equitable manner. Let me preface our debut of the rubric by saying to authors, we completely understand that the submission deadline is right around the corner and this is the kind of tool that is best utilized during the planning and conceptualizing stage. Please rest assured that there is no expectation that you can or should check every box. And in no way, shape or form is this a scorecard. Instead, please see this as a tool to help authors, reviewers and editors ask some reflective questions to start systematically thinking through the best way to center equity in all of our work. This is a living, working document that represents a starting point not a destination. We hope that the rubric will serve as a resource to help researchers center health equity as they conceptualize projects, design studies, analyze data, interpret and critically review results in the future. So let's dive in. A QR code for our special issue website, which includes the rubric, is here for your reference. And section one addresses our positionality. We realize that positionality statements are largely unfamiliar in OBGYN, but they're increasingly gaining traction in the wider scientific community. And we tried to model them in our own introductions today. In particular, Dr. Rivlin gave an excellent example of how such a statement could be included in your manuscript. Positionality statements are important because they help authors, reviewers, and readers reflect on how our position in life may influence how we approach a research question. It's essential to recognize that positionality is not just about race or ethnicity. It encompasses multiple dimensions of our identities, which can include our academic discipline, socioeconomic status, and prior life experiences. Positionality statements do a few key things for our research. First, they make us think about our, the composition of our investigator teams and hopefully encourage us to seek a multitude of perspectives. Second, they help us to explicitly reflect on how our life experiences and position in life may interface with and potentially bias the way we approach our research. Finally, acknowledging our positionality helps us think about how to address these strengths and limitations in much the same way we do in the discussion section of a paper. The positionality statement is entirely optional because we realize that there may be safety and other concerns with revealing aspects of one's identity. The word count may also be an issue, so positionality statements can either be included in the author's disclosures or in the body of the paper. If you need more context, the appendix of our equity rubric has additional helpful information and examples. We encourage authors to center health equity from the beginning of the manuscript. The introduction should help the reader understand why the research question is important and why answering it may promote health equity. 
For far too long, papers have defined the disparity and stopped there. But this prompt is designed to help us move beyond defining disparities for the sake of defining disparities and moving to the next level, which is intentionally taking meaningful steps forward to achieve health parity for all of us. This effort is often aided by grounding the research in a framework or conceptual model to study race and ethnicity. We debated this one as a working group because we know that the word count can be tight. There doesn't need to be a lengthy in-depth analysis of a framework in the paper, but frameworks can be helpful in allowing us to methodically think through a problem in the way that we design, execute, and report a study. An example of the NIM HD framework is shown here and several more are included in the equity rubric appendix for your reference. As a final note about the introduction, scientific papers often imply that race is the causal factor for poor outcomes, which is simply not true because race is a social construct with no real genetic basis. Centering equity means engaging in the notion that race is a social construct, but exposure to racism can have very real consequences in multiple domains, including biological. So now moving on to section three, the method section. During our webinar in October, Rose Horton from Emory Decatur Hospital used a phrase, nothing about us without us. We acknowledge that community partners can provide rich and diverse perspectives to inform research. If community or patient representatives were involved in the scientific process, please describe it. Potential examples include developing the research question, validating tools, interpreting results, and co-authoring papers with these community partners. Next, care should be taken to describe the way that race was ascertained. Was it self-report, which is generally preferred, or was it taken from the electronic medical record? In this case, the assigned race may be based on whoever the person interacting or registering the patient and how they perceived them. If self-report, was it categorical or open response? And were participants able to check more than one box? It's important to convey how this information was collected and what the implications may be for that research. We encourage you to take a look at the Flanagan article published in JAMA in August of 2021. And please note that there are hyperlinks to all of the articles we're mentioning in the rubric citation. Item 3C deals with recruitment strategies, and this is not one that we commonly think about, but acknowledging underlying power dynamics are key to advancing health equity. This question is designed to help authors reflect on any power impact power dynamics may have had in recruitment strategies. Finally, I think many of us trained to throw covariates like race and ethnicity into every multivariable model, but why? We encourage authors to pause and reflect on the underlying rationale to include covariates like race, race, ethnicity, marital and insurance status, and models, or who is the referent group and why, and then share the rationale with readers to better contextualize your work. Care should be taken in framing the results in section four. A review of the results sections of many health disparities papers could leave readers with the impression that historically marginalized groups are somehow culpable in poor health outcomes, which is not true and perpetuates a harmful narrative of oppression. We encourage authors to be thoughtful in their framing of results in ways that do not perpetuate racism and bias. Section five, the discussion section, provides a wonderful opportunity to contextualize the study's findings and more importantly, push us towards recommendations for next steps. 5A harkens back to 5C of the rubric and the importance of providing social and structural context for the research findings. In addition, unless the study specifically focused on genetic admixture test testing, genetic explanations of findings should be avoided because we've already established that race is a social construct. It's also important to consider how findings can meaningfully contribute to promoting health equity rather than think that our work is done because we found a disparity and we wrote about it. The focus of section six is the importance of language. We've all heard the phrase, um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And we know that's not truth telling because the matter of fact is that words matter and words can hurt and our words can cause harm. To this end, the terminology section is designed to help us take a step back and evaluate the way that we're using language in our scientific writing. 
we want to use people first language rather than defining people by a disease like diabetes and use words that promote the dignity of people. Items six B and C are consistent with the Flanagan JAMA article and Green Journal Stylistic Guide terminology. And we encourage you to use the hyperlinks in the rubric citations to look up these articles. And if we look at section seven in the rubric, what it does is provide a broad general unwrapping of all the concepts we just covered. And then specifically, section seven A talks about centering the margins. And when we speak of that, what we're talking about is how do we move the dominant narrative, both culturally, but also experiential, where the narrative throughout biomedical research and, and medical research overall is focused on the white experience in this country and abroad. How do we center the margins of the experiences of those who have historically not been the center of the story, i.e. communities that have been historically marginalized? It then leads us to intersectional identities in 7b, understanding that the concepts of intersectionality, a critical race theory tenet, tells us that the compounding effects of identities is that one's identity can be complex and diverse, but also means that they're experiencing difficult, nuanced levels of oppression that we may not understand because we don't carry those same identities. And we can't, can't isolate people's identities just into one bucket or the other, but actually they are the full complex beings of both or the multiple identities they carry. And in 7C, the disciplinary bias, and a big part why I'm proud to be part of this as a critical race scholar, is our committee, our subcommittee, is made up of more than 50% of folks who are not OBGYNs. Why? Because we understand the importance that we may have gaps in the way we understand the data, analyze it, and even speak about it. And so when we can share the interdisciplinary frameworks and understandings across campuses and across disciplines and in community, we start painting a more richer, clear history, science, and a clarity of where the inequities exist so we can really further address them. And if we look at number eight in the rubric, speaking of references, and I truly believe it's incredibly important and it's something that I've committed myself to and I know many folks on our subcommittee is that References are the power of academia. And if we are not diligent and intentional in our act of equity and justice in the way we cite, we most certainly are going to struggle in providing equity in the language that we write in our papers. And what do we mean by that? Is we're clear that citations are the marker of academic engagement, without a doubt. So who are you citing? If there is a concept, a tenet, a framework that speaks about equity, about justice, about cultural experiences of identities that are not white, we are almost certain that there is someone who is also not white who wrote the paper, and it may not have been peer-reviewed, but there is a paper or there is a publication that was written by a black, brown, indigenous, or other person of color. And we need to get to those primary sources, lift those voices up, and make sure that they get the recognition they deserve because we know that it is the currency, particularly in academia, for the career milestones that all of us deserve for the hard work in doing this, this writing, this research, and this publishing. And so in your bibliography, we want you to ask the question, is it reflective of the voices of who I'm speaking about? And if it's not, then we want you to reconsider who you are citing. And that is the first iteration of our equity rubric. I'm incredibly grateful to the equity rubric working group representatives of whom we've heard from today. And they're denoted here with aqua asterisks in the setting of the larger special issue steering committee who have thoughtfully guided the Green Journal on this journey. I also wanna thank the Green Journal editorial leadership team and staff led by editor in chief, Dr. Jason Wright and managing editor, Stephanie Hassway. As I said before, this rubric is a starting point and not a destination. So we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. Please feel free to email obgyn at greenjournal.org. This page is your one-stop shopping for authors submitting to the special issue with all of the helpful resources we've already released. The call for papers, website, webinar, and editorial from our July 2022 edition. Here are some final helpful tips for submissions to the Green Journal special issue on racism and reproductive health. And thanks so much for tuning in.